All right. Uh, good late morning, folks. Uh, we will start the process of reconvening uh, for the late morning session. Um, let me first just introduce myself. My name is Mosi Ifatunji, uh, and I'm an assistant professor uh, of sociology at UNC Chapel Hill across the pond. Uh, and I'm going to be introducing Min Zhao and also facilitating the afternoon panel. Um, and so before we get started up, I just want to uh, sort of generally get us thinking here um, in a certain kind of historical contextual way. That is to say that you know, one of the things that distinguishes American sociology from its European progenitors is a deep concern with race and migration, right? So we can go all the way back to uh, Robert Park, W.B. Du Bois, and all of the ways in which American sociology wrestled with new questions that weren't necessarily on the front burner in Europe. Um, and Min Zhao's work has been squarely in that, in that area. Over the course of her career, she's contributed um, a, in a range of ways to our understandings of how race and migration work in the United States. And I might add that she's done so uh, incredibly graciously, but also with uh, uh, an ability to uh, be provocative. And so um, I look forward to her comments here today. As you know, Minzu is the professor of sociology uh, of, of, of sociology and Asian American studies, the Walter and Shirley Wang Endowed Chair in U.S.-China Relations and Communications, and founding chair of the Asian American Studies Department at UCLA. She is also a uh, Tan Lark Tsai Chair, uh, Professor of Sociology at Nen Nanyang uh, Technological University in Singapore. And she's going to uh, talk to us today about her uh, uh, new work, The Asian American uh, Achievement Paradox, Hyperselectivity, and Unintended Qu Consequences. Please welcome uh, Dr. Zhao. Good morning. Thank you very much, Lucy. And thank you, Sandy, for inviting me. And thank you, everybody, for coming here to, um, to this very, very exciting and intellectually stimulating conference. I already learned so much from uh, the morning sessions. And there, there are a lot of parallels uh, between the North African experience in France and the Asian American experience here. So today, I would like to uh, say a few things about um, my current studies co-author with uh, Professor Jennifer Lee, used to be a colleague of the UC uh, campus uh, at uh, UC Irvine, and now she moved to uh, Columbia. So today, I want to say a few things. One is, I want to present you uh, a general socioeconomic profile of Asian Americans. And then um, I would like to uh, engage a little bit of the debate of what explains success. Um, what does success mean and what explains success? And then um, have some conceptual discussion on uh, the concept of immigrant selectivity, as uh, immigrant selectivity is a key uh, to understanding the intersection between culture and structure um, in uh, explaining social mobility. And then I present some results on uh, the Asian American achievement par uh, paradox, focusing on some of the unintended consequences of achievement. So here is um, our book, and our book, uh, Asian The Asian American Achievement um, Paradox, is focusing on addressing why the children of Chinese immigrants and Vietnamese refugees converge in higher education despite divergent origin. As we know, Vietnamese refugees were from humble social economic background, and most of them were penniless refugees when arriving in the country. Whereas Chinese immigration are more diverse, uh, containing a very significant number of um, uh, highly skilled and middle class immigrants as well. So we try to um, and, uh, we we try to provide an understanding of how culture intersects with structure to affect the racialization 
of uh, Asian Americans and their unintended consequences. So first, uh, let me present uh, to you some um, of the social economic characteristics of Asian Americans. So today when you hear Asian Americans, the, the image of the model minority pops up because they are successful in terms of their levels of education, levels of occupational achievement, and uh, levels of income. Um, and then, but in the past, the image of Asians in the United States were very negative. They were um, um, the, the uh, indispensable uh, enemy. They were the unfair competitors to American workers and whatnot. But the images had changed since the 1960s as impacted both by the civil rights movement as well as by uh, immigration. So today, um, Asian Americans is one of the is uh, one of is the fastest uh, racial minority group in the U.S. In 1960s, they were um, uh, they were an invisible group minority, uh, uh, comprised only um, less than one percent of the total U.S. population, and today uh, it uh, reached out to uh, almost 21 million and contains 6.5 of the total population. So still, it's the smallest racial group in terms of uh, numbers, but in terms of its population growth rate, it's very fast. And much of the growth is due to immigration. So if you are looking at the Asian American population, even though Asians has been in this country for a long time, earlier than many of the Southern and Eastern European um, uh, people, uh, but today they are still remain a predominant immigrant community uh, where 90% of the Asian American community are either immigrants or children of immigrants. So 90% of them grow up in immigrant families or in immigrant families. And they also have um, very diverse origin. They came from all over Asia. And in a sense, we have more than 20 categories of national origin or ethnic origin. Um, but anywhere in Asia, um, you would see people from. Um, and then also very diverse social economic background containing low skill labor, undocumented immigrants, as well as highly educated, high skilled labor. Um, so despite recency of immigration and diverse socioeconomic origins, Asian Americans now seem to fare better than other racial minority groups in the US. So um, pure, based on the US census and also their own national survey, um, um, so it's a national uh, uh, survey data, and they found that Asian Americans um, are more highly educated than the general U.S. population. So nearly 50% of the Asian American population have a college degree, and among those, half have a, an advanced master or over degree. And then if you are looking at their household income, Median household income. Their median household income is also significantly higher than the U.S. average, as higher than other racial groups, including the non-Hispanic white group. So, in the arena of education, their um, achievement is even more remarkable. So, if you are looking at Asian Americans, they are six uh, point. 5% of the U.S. population, but in prestigious universities, including uh, this university too, and there are more than 20% of the undergraduate student body who are uh, of Asian American origin. And that's not counting for international students. Again, international students, they are also potential immigrants because a lot of international students, after they complete their degree, they would stay in the US and become immigrants. And then in California, 13% of the population uh, is Asian. However, in the UC campus, in the more elite public schools, um, 
uh, the Asian American population, that's not counting, again, international students. Um, Berkeley, 40%, UCLA, 40%, and Irvine is greater than 50%. So the percentage is, is quite high. Um, right, so when we talk about success, the Pew Research Report, the data that I just show, uh, clearly uh, marks the, the, the criteria of success. That is, they have higher income, higher educational level, and if you are looking at their professional um, occupational achievement, 48%, close to 50% of the Asian Americans in the labor force, they hold a professional job. So that's more comparable to their general level of education on the whole. Um, so, so there is a lot of controversy on the Duke report, and the Asian American community also um, were, um, was from a point at the way that the, uh, the Pew report is presenting the, the quote-unquote hot data, and also uh, the media pick up the data point. So the data, point, the data points highlighted in the report and by the media would show that Asian Americans uh, have the highest levels of education and household income. They are more satisfied with their lives, their finances, and the directions uh, of the country. And they have greater values on marriage, parenthood, hard work, and uh, career success. So that not only um, present what is supposedly true of the data, but also highlight certain data point that is kind of imply Asian Americans are successful because they have the right value and come from um, a, a pre um, superior culture. So that reinforces the image of the model minority. Uh, and then also in reinforcing the model minority stereotype, it reframes the culture of poverty thesis into the culture of success antithesis. The two are hand in hand. Actually, the implication, the sociological implication, and the social impact is very similar. Um, so how, how, do, uh, how do we explain success? Um, in sociology, we kind of explain the upward social mobility, social economic status in terms of the heart indicators, in terms of level of education, occupation, and income. So in that, Asian Americans are successful. But in our research, we, we show um, uh, more nuance and complexity of the notion of success. But anyway, so there is um, several explanation and uh, a lot of the explanation focus on this debate between whether it is culture or it is structure. So the cultural explanation is um, highlighted by Amy Truss, like Tiger Mom book. So um, Amy Truss book, um, a tribute is a memoir. So attribute her children's success to um, to Chinese culture, to the Confucian culture that emphasized hyperdisciplinary. Uh, hyper-disciplining parenting, like tough on kids, strict rules, and then also focus on achievement, performance, and outcome, especially focus on outcome. You have to bring home straight A's. If you got uh, A minus, your tiger mom would ask you, why not an A plus? Um, so, so that is one explanation. And then the other explanation is more on cultural explanation, saying that uh, children's educational attainment and also future occupational attainment is very much um, determined by parental, by family socioeconomic status. In other words, this is a conventional model of social mobility, like fathers, or fathers especially fathers, mothers' education would affect children's uh, uh, outcome. And since half of the Asian Americans have an uh, educational degree, so you would expect uh, Asian Americans to be achieving, right? Um, because they have um, a, a more favorable starting point as a group. Uh, so that is a structural variable 
um, a structural factor in explaining the group's success. And then the other um, um, factors is more contextual factors that is um, um, attributing to a group's success to uh, broader changes in American society especially the civil rights movement that lead to the recognition of uh, minority status and also uh, the, uh, create pathways for uh, minorities to move up, uh, mo uh, move up um, and, and reduce the barriers, uh, especially the educational barriers. And that is a very important um, uh, context, larger society contextual factor. And the other one um, is the reform of immigration legislature. And the reform, um, the 1965 Hot Seller Act, the immigration reform that allows family unification as well as allows skilled labor to fill the needs of the US economy, does uh, usher in uh, streams of highly skilled immigrants. And that is a very important structural factor affecting success. So for us, either uh, for Jennifer Lee and I, uh, when we are trying to look into this uh, phenomenon, we feel culture is at work. But it's not innate, culture is not innate to a group. But culture emerged from structural circumstances. And that structural circumstances is the broad scale uh, immigration dynamic. So we try to build a model um, an interaction model to look at how culture interact with structural uh, variables in this book. So our central argument is an immigrant group's culture is not innate because there is nothing like a Chinese culture here and there is nothing like an Asian culture here. It's recreated. The quote unquote Asian culture is really emerged from um, the the structural circumstances of contemporary immigration that favor highly skilled immigrants. So immigration selectivity is the key. So next, we I want to discuss a little bit about um, immigration selectivity, why immigration selectivity is so important in as to understand um, social mobility of immigrants and also the children of immigrants. So what is immigrant selectivity? When we measure immigrant selectivity, uh, we look at immigrant groups' average level of education by year, years of education, compared to the average level of education in the sending country. So in that, most of the immigrants are positively selected. So that if we use that measure, it doesn't capture a lot of, it, it doesn't have very strong analytical rigor because everybody is positively selected. So we, Jennifer and I, refined the concept to have a more restrict um, uh, uh, definition. So we use the definition of percent college graduates to have uh, a notion of hyper-selectivity versus hypo-selectivity, and then high-selectivity. So it's more categorical. So what is hyper-selectivity? Hyper-selectivity is an immigrant groups, not by year, not by average year, but their proportion of college graduates vis-a-vis -vis their compatriots in the sending country and the home country. So if their level of um, um, education is higher than the home country, that's positively selected, but also higher than the receiving country, that group is hyper-selected. And hyper-selectivity has very significant consequences. And then hyper-selectivity is just the opposite. That is, the group uh, average, the proportion of college graduates lower than the sending country and lower than the receiving country. Now for that, not every group is positively, uh, is hyper-selected, right? So if we are looking at uh, this chart, you can see that the Chinese is hyper-selected. So the middle bar, the blue bar is the immigrants. So they are much higher than the Chinese in China. People think that the Chinese are well-educated, but 
Chinese in China, the proportion of college graduates, those holding a BA degree, is only 6% of the vast population, right? Uh, so in the, in the U.S., the average level of uh, college um, uh, graduates is 28%. So Chinese is clearly hyper-selected. Other hyper-selected group among Asians would be Indians, Filipinos, um, um, Koreans. And then Mexicans is the opposite. So Mexican is the hypo-selected group. Because of immigration selectivity, Mexican immigrants, their average level of education is low. It's much lower than that in, Mexican, uh, in Mexico. Actually, in the third world de developing country, Mexico has the highest, uh, you know, is, uh, one of the highest educated country. Um, and then they are lower than the U.S. average. Now, Vietnamese is a positive selective group. They are higher than the home country, but still lower than the U.S. average. But what we are trying to see that these two groups get racialized and become, and the Vietnamese as well as the low uh, social, uh, low income Chinese, they benefited from the hyper-selected group characteristics. So next, um, I will show you some results of the um, Asian American Achievement Paradox, the unintended um, consequences of hyper-selectivity. -select so one is just a simple class reproduction. Um, so middle class reproduce middle class. So if the group has a higher proportion of middle class, you would expect that the group has a higher proportion of middle class. So it's just that um, um, if you know, nothing is done. That's why it is very important to have external assistance, government policy, to help those groups who started from less advantageous socioeconomic background. It's very important. And then the cultural frame of success, that is the middle class frame of, of success. So the middle class, um, uh, uh, Annette Larao has um, that model of the different uh, culture of parenting that is very much tied to class, and they have that. And that cultural frame of success in America is very different from that in China or Vietnam. Here, the frame is very constricting, very narrow. Like you have to be a scientist, engineer, um, med med medical pr personnel, or lawyers. So that four, the big four, so if you are entering this big four, then you, are, you will be successful. Because in the US, they, they see a lot of people in the big four. There are a lot of role models up there. So they, the, the family would push the children there. Now, that's the middle class. They have the resources to support that frame. But the low-income families from the Asian communities, they also right on that. They also buy into that cultural frame. And where does their uh, the resources uh, come from? They got a lot of the resources from the ethnic community. So here is some of the unintended consequences. That is, if a group is hyper-selected, then that group tend to generate greater ethnic resources in the community in support of the the culture frame of success that the community is building. And the other thing is very important. There is a symbolic capital arising from, ironically, from stereotype promise. So if a group is successful, then the larger society would perceive them positively. That creates a positive kind of stereotype. We would argue that positive stereotype can only go so far. But in terms of school achievement, school attainment, it does have a positive effect of enhancing academic uh, performance. And then it leads to a, a, an achievement paradox. Let me uh, go into this in a little detail. So ethnic capital, in terms not only just setting up a 
frame, right? A cultural frame that there is this big four careers that the group think through education that pass, you can be successful. Um, the ethnic capital for a group that has a strong um, human capital, they also uh, tend to build cultural institutions and have practices. The cultural institution also stimulate the practices. So cultural institution meaning tangible resources in support of children's education. Like after school tutoring, there are a lot of ethnic entrepreneurship like they run companies, they run tutoring centers as a business rather than as a nonprofit entity. Um, so they, they're, uh, the tangible resources, they have a lot of those for profit cultural institutions to promote education. And then also there are intangible resources that is create an environment that enforce highlight and also reinforce enforce the cultural frame through the media and also through the social network and interaction. And then uh, there are information that circulate both formally and informally through ethnic channels, through social networks, through the ethnic language media and stuff to enforce the cultural frame and then also to promote um, education. So in the ethnic community, um, in a way that children feel pretty um, high, a lot of pressure of achieving because everywhere you go, um, you you see the the signal. Like even um, in the Chinese um, everyday greeting, here in America you say hi, how are you, right? In Chinese you say, have you eaten? 你吃了吗? Have you eaten? So eating is a very important thing. But now when, when, when parents or adults are addressing children, they will say, how are you doing in school? Implying, are you getting good grades in school? So these are some, some sort of pressure that is on you everywhere. Um, so in, in terms of tangible resources, you can see the Chinese and Korean yellow pages. It's thicker than the... In the past, you have the AT&T. Now, it's a thing in the past. It's thicker than those yellow pages. And you will see hundreds, uh, more than 100 pages that listing these cultural institutions that support children's education. So the children are not only doing preview. They are also doing review uh, on a course subject in the after school tutoring. So they are working three times as hard, right? Uh, the pressure on them. Um, and then, so here, and it starts from when they are kinder, in kindergarten, they already advertise and address them as scholars. And as a matter of fact, a lot of this, um, this academy is called Princeton or Harvard or Yale. Now in Korea, in co the Korean community, Princeton, Harvard, Yale are the three dream school of the parents. So, in, so the Koreans are feel more pressure because it's very hard to get into just this three uh, university. But for the Chinese, I said the Chinese have an easier time because UC is acceptable. Uh, they don't know that UC is also very hard to get in, right? <laughs> they call it UC is acceptable. And then there is this one, it's very interesting. I point to uh, the brain child in English but in Chinese, it's more than math. So these are for three-year-olds. So they have a lot of those um, um, institutions in both the Korean and um, uh, Chinese community. Now, the Vietnamese, since they live in the communities close to the Chinese community in Los Angeles, they also benefited from these ethnic institutions. But other groups, are not. Like in Koreatown, Koreatown, the majority of the residents in Koreatown are, are Mexicans and Central Americans, but they don't have access to the Korean um, um, uh, resources because of race, the race and also language factor. Um, and then there are also advertisements um, about tutoring and college prep, and all geared towards parents. 
And there are even slogans saying, "I guarantee to get your children into your dream school," not not the children's dream school. Uh, so here is、um, an interview excerpt from a Vietnamese. Like summertime, besides going to summer school every single year, we also did tutoring classes to get ahead. Like in junior high and stuff, we were talk, taking class ahead, like math classes. If we are going to take geom geometry, then we were doing it in summertime, and or algebra in summertime or summer before. In the Asian community, I think everyone does tutoring. Now, I'm not sure about that, but it's it's pretty common for Asian、um, uh, children to do tutoring, even those from working class and low income families, because those classes have a range of prices. If you are from middle class, you get you know better, like smaller classes, and if you are from the working class, you get larger classes. But you you getting tutoring is a way. Uh, to indicate that you are a good parent. If you don't do tutoring to your children, you are not a good parent. And then next is the symbolic capital thing. If in the society, right, because of hyperselectivity, a lot of Chinese、um, and Indian or Filipinos are in the professional sector, right. So that presents the image of Asians as highly educated professionals. And then for the in the school, the teachers also look at Asian as good good students. So there is this image of all Asians are good students. So this stereotype is not necessarily true, but it becomes true when it is favored by teachers or meet the teachers' expectations. As a matter of fact, there are a lot of、uh, cases in our interview that they were not good students as they moved to high school, but the teachers think they are and put them into honors classes. And not only that, they also provide help, extra extra help to them, so they just click to it and hang out with、uh, with others. And then that stereotype promise becomes a symbolic capital, and that is a societal effect. A societal racialized effect on them.、Um, so here is a, a case.、Um, I wasn't an exceptional student. I was a straight C student, whereas my other siblings they were straight A student. So what happened to Ophelia when she moved to high school? When she was placed into the AP track in high school, something just clicked, and she began to excel in classes. So she said, "I wanted to work hard and prove I was a good student because she was put track into AP, even though she was a, a, a C student."、Um, I think the competition increased your desire to do better. So, so she feel that. And then、uh, David, a 1.5 generation Chinese male, 1.5 generation refer to those children who arrive、uh, as.、Uh, At very young age, and second generation refers to the U.S. born.、Um, I think they, my teachers, view us positively, just because the perception that Asians Chinese typically do better in school than the Hispanics, and the Caucasians and African Americans. So that has、um, that indicate the impact of the stereotype promise that the Chinese、uh, or Asian students. Um, uh, uh, view positively. Again, the teachers doesn't distinguish between the hyper selected group or the the negatively selected group. Right, the Chinese Cambodians, if they are same in the same school, they would put into the categories of Asian being Asian as good student. Okay. Next,、uh, lastly, is the Asian American paradox. So we will see that academic achievement is racialized as an Asian thing, both internally and externally. Both, um, uh, both um, Asian Americans themselves. I have my own timer.、Uh, both Asian Americans themselves、um, uh, think that that Asians are high achiever. And then also their classmates and their teachers also think of them as Asian. And there are process of Asianization both in school and out too.、Um, so the paradox is 
um, we found that the more successful, like the higher achiever, are less likely to feel that they are successful than the less successful among Asians. And the less successful, they are more likely to feel they are successful. They are successful. So when, it, when we ask the highly achieving Asian Americans, like our data is um, uh, collected from uh, those age 20 to 40. So even among, there are a lot of young adults. So when they reflect back on, and then even their current status is considered very successful, but they don't think of themselves as successful. One is, you know, their tiger mom, their mom never think that they are good enough. The other is they tend to look at, um, they tend to look at not non-Hispanic white as the, the benchmark, for comparison, or average American as the benchmark, they look at more successful Asian Americans as the benchmark. So that's why they feel less successful on that. So that put, exerts a very heavy emotional toll to them. So Asian Americans in general, they are very high achieving in terms of this objective outcome, but in subjective understanding of their success, they feel l uh, less confident about their, their sense of, they have um, less confidence and also less confidence about their um, self-achievement. So finally, um, I, I will discuss about the exact, uh, the, res, the, the impact of new stereotypes. So one is uh, what we just mentioned, the positive effect, and I said that the positive effect can go go only so far. So it gets you good grades in school. There is that outcome. And also it gets you into the door of the labor market. But that's that. So when they get you into the school, a good school, or your parents' gym school, the Asian Americans tend to feel that they are at a loss because all the way they are kind of socially engineered towards that narrow frame, right? So we have, um, in Asian American studies, we have a lot of uh, pre-med students. Once they take my class, some of them shift to Asian American studies. I said, are you sure? Did you talk to your parents? I don't want your parents to kill me. Um, in our interviews, there are uh, these cases that is very sad, that one of them said that, I. You shift from um, pre-med, from biology to Asian to English. He, he shift to English. He said, I don't want you to destroy your parents' dream. So it's like when you shift to something that you are passionate about, then, then it's not considered successful. So that puts pressure on them. And then there are a lot of negative effects. It creates new stereotypes. That is the tiger mom stereotype. Thinking about Asian American achievement is due to overbearing parents. If they don't have overbearing parents, they won't be achieving. And then the other stereotype is the nerd stereotype um, that uh, they achieve because of hard work. So they are less likely to view as self-starters, risk takers, independent thinkers, and leaders. Um, and then to conclude, um, our study is to show that culture matters, but not in the mythical way of what is um, uh, intrinsically Asian. And there is actually no such a thing as Asian culture, and the culture is really affected by the structural uh, uh, circumstances of hyper-selectivity. Um, and then also, um, I did not have time, I do not have time to go deep into the negative effect of um, of the bamboo ceiling uh, barrier. That is, Asian Americans, normally they don't have problem getting a job. But once they get into the job, they have big problems trying to move up the rank in the labor market. So that it's not just a glass ceiling effect, 
but it's also a bamboo ceiling effect. The bamboo ceiling effect, the glass ceiling effect, you see clearly what's on top, but it's very hard to break, right? A bamboo ceiling effect, you cannot even see what's clearly on top. And it's very resilient. Bamboos are very resilient. So it's very hard to break it. Um, so I will stop from here. Thank you. So as I, as I said, it's sort of the opening, right? In American sociology, one of our primary distinctions from where we come from in Europe is sort of this uh, uh, fascination or struggle with uh, race and migration and that uh, Min Zhao's work over the course of her career has contributed neatly in that tradition. Um, this particular book, I think, uh, is in conversation with a few people in particular. So. I think about Doug Massey and William Julius Wilson's thinking about how culture, how culture, cultural forms are a product of structural opportunities, right? And that, for example, uh, if you're not given, if you're kept out of certain areas and not able to do certain things, then you develop a set of values and behaviors uh, that are in response to that. Um, I also see the work in, in conversation with Barry Chiswick and uh, Borjas uh, and also Sandy Darity on this notion of the role of uh, selectivity in achievement in general. And there's a nice, neat distinction that I think that you're, that you're making here. So Chiswick's conception of selectivity is that any migrant who gets up and moves across the world is going to be more ambitious uh, and, and highly skilled uh, than the people that they leave behind. Uh, and if the, the distribution of skill is roughly uh, normal any given, in any given country, that people who are positively selected from the right tail of the distribution in the sending country will uh, join the right tail uh, in, the, in the receiving country. Um, Sandy Darity, uh, the, the implication of that is that immigrants also ultimately do better than natives in the, in the labor market because they have higher skill, um, sort of soft skills in particular. Sandy Darity's contribution into the conversation has been uh, that, yes, folks are more highly selected, but they also come from not only sort of motivational, soft skill backgrounds, it's not just an individual immigrant sort of deciding to migrate all by themselves independently, but they usually come from uh, elevated class backgrounds. And so what we see in terms of the success of immigrants in the United States is that they are replicating class uh, structures from the ascending country, right? Um, and then uh, Min Zhao and, and Jennifer Lee's conception of hyperselectivity joins in this conversation, uh, essentially arguing that um, because of the uh, greater selectivity of the uh, relative to the sending country and greater selectivity of the of the receiving country, um, that uh, Asian Americans develop cultural forms and tools that allow them to 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 do better, and that in, in many ways this selectivity is also structured by immigration policies and things like that. Um, so the question, sorry. <laughs> so the question here, right, given this larger debate happening in sociology um, at, at this time, uh, does your orientation to the problem under investigation assume a certain, ultimately, a meritocracy in, in the United States? That is to say, to what extent does actual skill level, at the end of the day, whether produced by culture or structure or whatever, what does that have to do with actual achievement? So I find one of your particular um, comments instructive that even though uh, low performing Asian Americans who hold uh, 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 stereotypes in their heads about the, the greater achievement of Asian Americans writ large, even when they underachieve, they're still placed in uh, 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 higher classrooms, and in fact, in some ways, you have contributed to this, right? In the sense that um, you, your response to your student, I don't wanna, are you sure you wanna change? I don't wanna get your parents mad. All of that is a contribution to uh, the student potentially saying, oh yeah, you know what, you're right. I don't wanna do Asian American studies. I wanna do medicine, right? And there's, there's ways in which um, the success is, mar is, is not only, um, manufactured, but I think more, more importantly, allowed, right? And so I'd like to hear your thinking on sort of the role of merit overall, right? Whether a product, a structure, or a culture in, in, in sort of racialized disparities in achievement. Yeah. Can I borrow your pen? Please, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Thank you, Mosi. 
those, this is a very um, important question that we are trying to uh, stress. Now, um, the belief in meritocracy, the immigrants, they truly believe in meritocracy. And currently, you are, t you are hearing about the Harvard lawsuit, right? So um, the, the plaintiff, a lot of them are Asian immigrant parents. And they believe that Harvard is discriminated against Asians because they think that in America, we sh you know, meritocracy is equal. Um, and also in the Asian American community, there is this trend of uh, neoconservatism um, um, that you know, there is a section of the Asian American community who are against affirmative action, thinking that affirmative action is uh, taking away their children's seats in elite colleges or in public, good public universities. So the immigrant parents um, coming from the United States, they have a very um, uh, clear goal of moving their children up to society through education and they believe that education is their only path to success. But education is not everything. That's why they have this narrow frame of success that you have to get into these big four. Well, there are others too, but the big four captures um, what the Asian Americans believe in meritocracy because they think these big four depend a lot on the hard skill and the soft skill. And hard skill you can engineer, you can train, but soft skill, it's harder, it's a different story. So they believe in that. But then the negative consequences would be what I mentioned, that there are new stereotypes coming in to, against them. And also, even Asian Americans, when they come to college, they, they have a lot of advantages in terms of their grades and performance outcomes, but those advantages does not translate through the four years of college. So in a way, the extraordinary Asian Americans, when they come into uh, the university, they do not have a lot of advantages in terms of time to degree and also the college, um, a general college attainment. And then also in the labor market as well. And the labor market, one, one uh, thing that I noticed that when the Asian Americans are into this profession, they are not as fire to move up to the leadership position as well. So not only that, that, that they are blocked by the societal bamboo ceiling, but they internalize that bamboo ceiling too. So they, um, they feel that it's difficult and they are not the leadership quality, so they don't pursue it. They just you know, be a good engineer, be a good technician, be a good scientist. All right, so now we'll open up for questions. Yeah. Uh, hello, that was a very nice presentation. Thanks for it. Uh, I like the two points that you made about one was selection, self-selection of immigrants, and the second was about reference category. Uh, I going back to this way uh, t uh, Barry Tiswick uh, talked about selection, self-selection of immigrants, and uh, I think um, you are defining self-selection, one of the markers that you're using is education. Uh, several other uh, scientists have, social scientists have looked at self-selection that cannot be measured just with education, motivation, or uh, you know, ability to uh, take risk. Um, a big part of uh, economic research in this area is hampered by the fact that we don't really have longitudinal data. So as a result, uh, some of the um, ethnic minorities who, uh, like Asians, who are not really returning that much back to Asian countries, there uh, you can actually look at uh, uh, cross-sectional data and determine what's going on with this population, but certain other populations like Mexican immigrants or Latino immigrants, there it's largely affected because there's a lot of, there's not just self-selection, but there's also 
a return migration going on, selective return migration. And some of the work that I've done with some colleagues using longitudinal data, I find that uh, that's where I come to the reference category that you were talking about. For Mexican immigrants, as they using longitudinal data that takes care of return migration, that there is a large, there is a quite impressive achievement over time in terms of wages. Uh, that their wages grow over time. In fact, that group I find is, uh, our research finds that they have actually done much better than the other ethnic groups, which is Asians and European groups. We find that uh, Mexicans have done much better. And I would just end this, my comment, with uh, an example, a story uh, that I came across a few um, years ago. Uh, just to emphasize the other selection that happens with immigrants. Uh, I was at a conference sitting next to me, was a migrant from Mexico, and he had one of his limbs broken, uh, and I was uh, quite conscious of that. And uh, he himself started talking to me. And he said that he came to the United States, he went to Chicago, and he started working in a textile mill because he was uneducated. He could not read the instructions on the machine and he lost his limb. He moved on from the textile factory to uh, work as a dishwasher in a restaurant. Then he moved on to, the, to New York and at the time when I was talking to him, he had three stores in New Jersey and he was talking about campaigning for the post of mayor in the city from where he was in Mexico. And he said that his campaign uh, promise is going to be that he wants to talk about education, that he came to the United States and because he didn't have education, he lost his limb. Now he, subsequently, he actually won the election. I was sitting there listening to the story and I was saying, wow, this, this was a very inspiring story for me. You know, even though I'm one of those really positively selected immigrants, but I felt that he had achieved far more than what I did because, you know, it's just un incomparable compared to what, uh, what I had or many Asians do. So I wanted to s just say that this, the selection that happens on other criteria in other, uh, you know, um, immigrant groups is also quite impressive. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, there's a lot more talk now on how uh, Chinese immigrants, like no, Chinese students who come to the US are returning more than previous generations to China, for example. Is this happening in, with other Asian communities? And how does that affect um, the future of what the patterns that we see? Also, um, there was a Pew Research study that came out earlier this year that talked about African immigrants being better educated than the natives they find in Europe and in, the, in North America, with the exception of Italy. And will they experience that same success or would their experience be different because of the perceptions of Africans and black Americans in the US? And finally, I don't know how vast your definition of Asian is, but do you find differences between, say, East Asians, South Asians, Central Asians? Do you go as far as the Middle East and how, what their patterns are in the US? Thank you. Thank you. Do you want me to address the question? Yeah, uh, to Ninja, Ninja's question. Um, very good. Uh, that is actually a point that we have been making, that it depends on different um, definition of success. And also, even when we, decide, uh, when we accept the definition of success as level of education, occupation, and income, and then, but we also need to have a reference group to, to rank successful or not successful, and then success is also externally perceived and also self-perceived. And we, we notice that Mexicans are the most successful group if the reference group is their parents. 
or their peers. They are the most successful group. And Asians, they, you know, even if they are the same as, um, um, as their parents, right, they are less successful in that light. But compared to the uh, larger group, then they become successful. So the reference group is very important. Our data actually, uh, our interview data includes 56 Mexicans and uh, 24 native born uh, black and white as comparison group to, to look at this. Um, so the, the point is well taken. So we should be aware about what we de define success and apparently the how the respondent defines success and how we as a scholar define success is different and also the reference group. So, so when we measure success or achievement, you know, which one is the, the reference group? If you compare to the immigrant parents' generation or your co-ethnic group, then, then it's different than if you contrast to the average American population or the dominant non-Hispanic white group. So that's one. And Maria's questions, excellent. I was going to, uh, to, to mention some of these. Um, one, the definition of Asians. So in the United States, in our immigration policy, actually anywhere east of Afghanistan is defined as Asian. Um, and then, you know, if you are in Middle East or like Turkey, you are Middle East or Central Asia rather than Asian. So again, you know, the definition of what is being Asian is, it is different. And also, there is a big distinction between East Asian and other Asian. So East Asian, mostly Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and Vietnamese. And East Asian is more from the Confucianism kind of cultural background. And, um, but Somehow, Southeast Asian, like Cambodians, Laotians, and Hmong, they are also pushed into uh, Asian, the broad Asian categories, as well as today, South Asians as well. But Filipinos is um, uh, in between categories. They straddle between Asian and Latino because of the Spanish colonization. So there, there are interesting studies about these kind of racialization about identify as Asian versus identify as Latino. It has an impact on your performance as well as an impact on how the larger society look at you. And the other question is, um, is the Chinese students, um, Chinese students are potential immigrants because a larger proportion of them after they receive their degree, they will stay. But things have changed in the past five years, five, 10 years, because there are a lot of Chinese students coming here, and those Chinese students are from the one-child family uh, policy, so they are the single child. So they are expected by their parents to return. And also, they, are, they want to return, because China is fast, it has a fast developed economy, and have better jobs if you are, have parental social network. Whereas here, you have to struggle. And a lot of the Chinese younger students today, they don't want to stay because they don't want to struggle and having to deal with the issue of race and racial discrimination and stuff. So you will see that there is a larger proportion of Chinese students who are returning today than in the 1980s, 1990s, and even the first half of the the new millennium. Um, and also you see that the Chinese students today, the international students on campus, they have a very strong national identity. National means being Chinese. So that national identity, it's both um, a statement of, um, of them being an international student and also a statement of national pride. So it's very uh, different when we think about them uh, as, as before. Um, uh, when we 
when you think about the Chinese students who were from a diverse uh, social economic background, but today's um, you have more students have more students from middle class background than those in the 1980s and 90s. Now the African experience is very interesting. It's an opposite of the because of racialization. It's the opposite of the Asian American experience. Now, um, African immigrants to the United States, they are among the highest educated group. So in a way, they are hyper-selective, right? But their community is racialized into African American community. So they, um, um, in a way, in order to move ahead, sometimes they assert their immigrant identity and distinguish themselves from African American in order to get ahead. So that also indicates the, the, the nuances of race at work and, and race interacting with ethnicity and also citizenship status. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.